Hello, welcome to Graphic Policy Radio, where comics and politics meet. This is your host, Elon Levin. And this is the sort of podcast for people who got really excited when last time there was a Black Panther movie and racial justice organizations started doing voter registration of people waiting in line to see Black Panther. And they put out this hashtag, Wakanda the Vote. It was this big national effort. It was really exciting. If you're like the kind of person who gets excited about that, then this is the kind of podcast for you. Today, I'm joined by a panel of organizers, film critics, narrative strategists, all around smart people. And I cannot wait to talk with them about the newest Black Panther movie, which is called Wakanda Forever. I'm I'm coming at this from the perspective of being someone who um, knows the characters from the comics and has read them, but I want to predominantly play a role as facilitator here rather than as like opinionizer. I'm really excited to have all these guests joining me. Joining me actually for the first time on the show is Marcus Pinn. Marcus runs the film. Yes. Marcus runs the film blog. Pinland Empire, where he writes about film and makes movie comparisons. In addition to his personal film blog, he co-hosts the podcast Zebras in America, which isn't actually sung, but I have to sing it because it makes me excited. Uh, And he writes for various movie platforms. Welcome to the show, Marcus. Oh, thank you for having me. Of your various movie comparisons where you kind of post screenshots from different movies against each other, which one do you feel like has been the most viral on Twitter, R.I.P.? Oh, well, that's a fact. I did like ruin it ruined my weekend years ago. I uh, I did a comparison of um, there's a scene from the last uh, Star Wars movie that was similar to a scene in Vertigo. And then I posted it. It went semi viral. A bunch of people like Washington Post, New York Times, a bunch of people picked it up. Um, and then this other guy stole it. Um, and then it went oh, super viral. And then people came back to mine and thought that I stole it from him because he has got more attention. But it was like, oh, no. I didn't even care. I mean, a lot of my comparisons get stolen. <laughs> I didn't actually care about it. It was more just the stealing of it. The If I didn't think of it five minutes later, someone else was going to see the scene and go, oh, this is just like Vertigo. I usually, for the most part, try to compare stuff. Like, for example, a big part of my film site, I dedicate a lot. These days, I dedicate a lot of it to filmmakers like Chantal Ackerman, Claire Denis. Maya Darren, Carlos Regattas, Tarkovsky, Bergman, people like that. So those are a lot of the film comparisons I make. Um, so a Star Wars, Alfred Hitchcock comparison, I don't care. It, it, it was just the, the fact that someone stole it. But that is my <laughs> most uh, viral tweet. And I think it's funny because yeah. I got a lot of followers from it. And I remember kind of posting a disclaimer like, hey, I don't usually post comparisons too much like this. It's usually, I'll just say artsy stuff. Um, so... <laughs> I gained a lot well, of followers I, and then yeah. I lost a bunch immediately after. It yeah. seemed like, like oh, yeah. this like, is oh, a like, Star Wars account. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And joining me again uh, after the amazing visit to talk about Black Widow movie is Moji Alawode L. Moji Hi. is a recovered ad executive, one third of the host team at Feminist Buzz Kills Live, a weekly podcast that tells you everything you need to know about the state of abortion in the U.S. She loves yoga, reading sci-fi by femme people and people of color roller skates, talking loudly about her abortion and everyone else's reproductive rights in public spaces. Moji is a graduate of Sarah Lawrence College, like me, uh, and is currently having too much fun raising an adorable ass feminist in Harlem. Welcome back. Hey, glad to be back. Yeah, I can't believe it's been since Black Widow episode, but I really encourage folks to go give that a listen. Yeah, that was a fun time. I really like, I don't get to talk about Marvel movies much also because, you know, I'm always talking about abortion. So it's nice to um, switch it up. What I, I hate to, to be like, give me the quick version, but we we had a good election for abortion referendums, didn't we? Just oh my now? gosh, we had a great election. It's uh, can you believe we kept the Senate? I, I mean, yeah, no, I can't. But yeah, <laughs> can we believe we expanded our Senate. I, it's a wild. I feel like all day I've been a little bit on cloud nine about that. And we won the abortion referendums, I think, all, all of them. them all now, five of them. Or... Yeah, we won every single one. Um, and we have since stop. So that's pretty great. It's good to know that, you know, people care. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like abortion is popular on account of everybody having one. It's um, almost like people like to be able to do what they want with their bodies. Yeah, it's weird. Crazy time. Um, but yeah, it's really good. Well, anyway, if, if you want to hear me yammer about abortion, listen to the podcast. <laughs> I recommend it. It is really good. It is really good. Joining me uh, for, I don't know how many times, but that's because I love her that much, is Felicia T. Perez, is a frequent collaborator of mine. Felicia teaches narrative strategy to nonprofits and community organizations. Uh, 
sometimes with me. She uh, most recently produced the podcast Health and Climate Solutions Oral Storytelling Project. They hosted and created the Been There, Done That pandemic podcast. And in 2020, she was a lecturer at the University of Nevada, Reno in the Gender, Race, and Identity Department. Today, Felicia can be found at Task Force serving as their head of memes. Welcome It's true. Uh, back. There's a job like this. I love that title. It's, it's, yeah, it's Felicia's so the boss of memes. <laughs> the boss of all the memes. It's a weird thing. If folks remember the Black Panther fan activist con that I did a million years ago, but I guess, well, when the first Black Panther movie came out, um, Felicia yes. like literally told me how to make gifts at that conference. It's true. We actually both combined together taught lots of people how to make gifts. In fact, if you go on to Giphy, your phone, Twitter, any place that sources Giphy gifts and you put in Black Panther, it's m- more likely that you are receiving 90% of the content that we made then. Yes, that is entirely probable. Um, so as you can see, we have quite the lineup. Um, you know, I, I have a feeling that most people listening to this uh, are probably seeing Black Panther, but um, I do try to give like a, uh, a quick top line, spoiler free introduction of should people see this movie? So I'll take it from the top. Marcus, should people see this movie? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, generally speaking, it's a sequel. So see the first one, I would say, but yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, that's good. Because let me tell you, that's not my default answer for every Marvel movie. And I think it's important for folks to mind that, right? Um, Moji, were you generally feeling positive about the movie? I was. Um, I know we're going to get into the details, but I think just top line, absolutely see the movie. Um, unless you hated the first movie, then maybe not. But if you at all liked it mm. in any way, I would absolutely say see this movie. It, I didn't think they could do as good a job as I thought they did with what um, the obvious challenges that came up. Oh, and boy, were there many. And we will talk a little bit about some of them in just a little bit. And Felicia. I am not glad that I saw the movie. I am honored oh. and so incredibly grateful to have been able to see this movie. Um, it is beyond glad. And um, oh, you I had fucked also, me there. Right I know. There. I was like, I was really concerned. I, I was like, oh my gosh. gosh. <laughs> I know. I did it. Yeah. I did it. I did it. I, I was like the trailer for the for the sequel. It was like, is it about? No, it isn't. Yes. It, oh. So, anyways. Um. But the other thing that I will just say is that just to add on to that answer in question, I also think that you should see it in the theater. I think that you should see mm. it collectively with community. I think there's nothing wrong accessibility wise to wait and to see it in the comfort of your home safely if that's more accessible to you. And if you choose or have to do it in that manner, please see it with people at home because there is something to the community more than just you seeing it that really adds to the film experience, in my opinion. That makes sense. I mean, I definitely think that the movie, my experience, I liked the movie and I think folks should see it. I I don't think I liked it as much as the first one, but I did like it. But I think that some of my experience was compromised by the fact that I was seeing it in a drive-in theater um, because that's how I go to see movies now with COVID. And um, we didn't have a great seat. And a fair amount of the cinematography is 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 dark in a way that was sort of hard for me to visually process from this particular setting. I don't think that that will be the experience of other people seeing this movie. If I wasn't for the fact that I knew I'd have to cover this right away for the podcast, I probably would have been better off waiting to see it at home with some friends versus the drive-in. But most people are probably not <laughs> seeing movies in a drive-in right now. Um I, I will, uh, I'll get to the, let's just say from, from here on out, we are, we are going to be talking a hundred percent, hundred percent spoilers, but I definitely felt like there was definitely subtleties to the cinematography that I'm sure I missed because of the circumstances. And I, I do miss that community experience too. So let's like shout out some standout performances because I know that one of the huge things for everyone with the first movie was that really was one of the things we thought about and having this great loss which we'll be talking about as well in a little bit. Like, what are some good standout performances from this film? I think that Letitia Wright was so much better grabbing the mantle of the um, of the lead of the movie than I expected of her. I think over the last couple of years, we've I think what we hear from her is about whatever is happening with the COVID denier, she, not denying she may or may not be doing. I couldn't actually find real evidence that it was a thing she said. Um, mm. but I thought that, you know, when, when it occurred to me, like, oh, she's really carrying this movie. I just thought she did. I was like, oh, she's actually a really great actor. <laughs> um, and obviously just sort of as a supporting character, you didn't see that quite as 
apparently, but I think as kind of our lead, I thought that she carried it really well. Yeah, I thought the same. I was, you know, it's like, oh, without Chadwick. I mean, generally speaking, yeah, like, <clears throat> how are they going to pull this off? But I, I thought she did a good job. Um, and, you know, yeah, outside of Marvel, I thought, you know, for those listening, check her out in the Small Axe film. Um, if, if you haven't seen it yet, it's I think nowadays with franchises like this, a lot of actors, especially young actors like her, are going to just be synonymous with their Marvel roles. So mm-hmm. it's like stuff that she does outside, you know, like that episode of Black Mirror. And again, uh, M- M- Mangrove, which was her the movie she was in, that the Steve McQueen small act series. She does a really good job in that also. So she's huh. she's got that. She's got the chops. Yeah. I mean, um, I. I'm not at all saying that I didn't think she had the chops because no, I'm like, no, Marvel no. I think has other all the people money. haven't. Uh, other people oh, definitely yeah, were saying like, that that was a lot of the talk before this movie yeah. came out. I'm like, Marvel has all yeah. the money and they really do spend the money on the on kind of the best actors they can get. I just um Ted was just so good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, for for me, the standout performances are actually more sound based. Um, the musicians and the songs and the music for this particular film, you heard languages that aren't typically sung or heard in movies. There was a lot of Mayan and Mexican singers and artists and musicians yeah. that were a part of the soundtrack. That for me, that was the representation. There was so much representation and amazing talent throughout the film as someone who identifies as Latinx. Um, and has indigenous, you know, an indigeneity roots and ancestry. I just feel like in this particular film, there were so many sensory moments for me, and it was the sound and it was languages and so many different kinds of languages that are familiar or not, or because they weren't familiar, made me listen, if you will, even more and deeply to see if I could distinguish what it was or its origin. And that for me Mm. was the standout performance. It was... If there's a really interesting point, you know, there's, um, as someone who has terrible Spanish, but has a little bit of Spanish, like I, I had this moment of listening to the scenes where Lupita Nuango is talking with, um, a woman in Mexico. She's trying to figure out where Shuri has been kidnapped to. And I'm listening to this and I'm like, Ooh, my Spanish is not that bad. I'm following this perfectly. I mean, it's subtitles, but I swear to you, I knew what they were saying the majority of the time. And then you have this pivot. And I feel like the movie's doing it for dramatic reasons. Like, it pivots to doing in native and indigenous languages. And then even then you have a lot of language switching with in Wakanda, where you people yes. will switch from speaking in English to speaking in Zosa sometimes to like punctuate conversation. I'd, I'd love to hear folks thought about those sort of switches, switching between the different languages in the movie. Well, you know, Lupita is a Mexican national. I Lupita did, yeah. is an actor. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. right. Was born no, in that's Mexico. True. It's I funny. I said, that that's my, true. That's true. I, yeah. right? I said that to my friend mid movie. I was like, oh, we always forget that Lupita is Mexican and actually chose Lupita as her name because she yes. lives in, she lives in, Me- you know, she's a Mexican. She was raised in Mexico or spent significant yes, time there. Yes, she was born and, and raised in Mexico. And so there's a part where Lupita really, as as their character, doesn't actually come into the film until a little bit later, right? And that also foreshadows and hints to like all the reason why she's not around and why would the why would the queen go and see her and this child that goes and embraces the queen from behind, and then later we n- learn about this child later at the end of the film. But Lupita as an actor really represents so much of this this intersectionality and complexity and nuance to the film itself. And so there's so much that's on the the fictional and the non-fictional part of this film that really brings so many different cultural and multicultural elements to it. So that for me was the best. I've heard Lupita speak Spanish in interviews with other Spanish-speaking actors, particularly around Star Wars. And when Mm -hmm. uh, Lupita played the voice for... um, you know, Bots Maru, or not, sorry, not Bots Maru. That's a, that's a Sanrio character. Um, uh, oh, I'm like, Mas wait, Canada. I mean, it sounds like Mas it could Canada. be. Yes. Yeah, Bots yes. Canada. Um, but when she was doing interviews to promote the Star Wars film, her Spanish, you know, was okay. In this particular film, estaba hablando tan bueno. She was perfect. She was <laughs> on point. And she sounded and spoke in such a way where it really, like, you know, I don't look like Lupita. Lupita doesn't look like me. But for the briefest of moments, we sounded the same. And that was another mm-hmm. moment. Again, for me, the standout performances are more auditory than they are anything mm-hmm. else. I also think in introducing uh, the this, this society, this underwater, you know, indigenous society, Black Panther did that beautiful trick that I loved from the first movie, which is 
introducing us to an uncolonized um, culture from a colon- from a space that we know is just colonized. Mm. Uh, and I, I thought that that was really fun and interesting. And I like that they chose to, you know, just be like, these people were not colonized. They managed to get out and create a whole society outside of that. Um, and I thought that was maybe, I don't know. I just thought that was really beautiful and inspiring. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's funny. No, it's funny. You said, I'm not trying to jump ahead, but I love that too. The thing is I love no more. And I loved all those people. And it's funny because normally I wouldn't way Marvel has been handling villains in the second half of whatever phase or just, I'll just say the second half of this MCU. Yeah. I'm not always happy with it because I can be literal minded sometimes. And it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know, you're making me, can we even call them villains or him the villain? You're kind of making me like him to some degree, similar to Killmonger, which I'm sure yeah. we'll get into that too. I just, I'm not saying across the board, but this movie, as much as I loved how they actually handled them more. And I actually, I didn't really hate the guy until like one particular act that he did, but still it was almost too late because you gave me this backstory that made me like, oh, I get it. But to some degree, the more I watch a lot of these Marvel movies, it makes me miss folks like Ironmonger or Abomination or or Red Mm. Skull, just people who like I don't. And, and, and to be clear, I at this point, because everything is crossing wires now, I'm including the TV shows as well. Sure. All of the villains, especially in this last quarter, is just kind of like, oh, well, I kind of get why you are the way you are. I don't even know if I want to call you a villain, even though that's what yeah. we're technically supposed to call you. Mm-hmm. And the more fits in that mold. But he's kind of my exception because I actually like I, I, I liked him. But I, I do kind of want more just evil, diabolical terrible people as, as as villains going forward maybe maybe we'll get that with Kang but um I, yeah I oh, fully yeah, yeah. agree I disliked Namor for about three minutes in the movie and besides yeah. that I was kind of like this man has a point he has reasons like immediately when I he explained it. right away when he was ex- when he ascended from the water and and expl- I was like it makes sense he's just trying to you know they made it this far and it's like if you're in his position you don't want one person to kind of undo what you've been doing for all this time. So it's like, I get why he is the way he is. And it, it, it almost transitions from the first film. It was Killmonger was right. And to some degree, it's like Namor was right. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So, yeah. And that was, that was what happened after the first Wakanda, right? Like there was a lot of back mm-hmm. and forth conversation yep. and some discourse around like, wait a minute, <laughs> I identify more with Killmonger, but he's clearly being vilified in this film. Yeah. So, Ed, do I identify with the villain? Am I am I on the right side? Right. Right. And we've had yeah. so many years. We've had decades of the supervillain, <laughs> the villain who has feelings, you know, from yeah, and I'm like, going I'm going outside of a genre. I'm going from Tony Soprano to Walter White. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. You know, you've got these moments that make it cool to be the villain. So I'm not necessarily surprised that we have a January 6th and a Donald Trump and and all these things, because it's okay Mm. to be the bad guy as long as bad is equated to power over. And I think that that's that's the complexity of these films is that we're still talking about power. And so when we're talking about these indigenous communities, whether it's the Wakandans or the Dalakans, you know, like which is what. Uh, Namor is, you know, coming from these Mesoamerican indigenous groups on both sides and all the different, you know, tribes and communities that are coming out in these two films. What we have is power, keeping it, keeping that sovereignty that comes, you know, that power that comes with sovereignty, with self-determination versus the power over. And I think that's the distinguishing difference here, right? Like, are they villains when they're just trying to stay in power or stay autonomous, kill longer? Was there autonomy there? Was there was there righteousness in their cause? Where does righteousness, you know, like lend itself really becoming a villain or not? And yeah. when we're talking about the reality of the world that we have right now, we have folks in the in the nonfiction world who also think that they are <laughs> righteous in their white supremacist thoughts, right? That they are holding on to power that has been, you know, dis- they've, they're descendants of that power. And so things can get really complicated and so, you know, what's what's interesting to me is that, you know, in, in brown communities, the, the fighting that's happening right now is don't you dare call these characters in this film Latinx. They are indigenous. They are Mesoamerican. They are not Mexican. They are not colonized groups. They are pre that. They are holding that line. Mm-hmm. So please do not call them Latinx. And so there's there's a lot of complexity here. I also I think um, just bringing it to the world of the film. 
I think I think you made some really good point in in how like white supremacists also are like, we're holding the line, we're maintaining our space. But in the world of the film, what we have are these two non-colonized indigenous indigenous communities, right? We could, could consider our Wakanda an indigenous African community, right? Yes. That it was non-colonized. Yeah. Colonized. And then we have the Americans and the French doing what they've always done. Like, mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. not like their fears are unfounded. It's not like they don't have a legitimate reason to be worried or like, oh, that's the past. Things have changed. Um, right. When when Julia Louis Dreyfus character says, you know, when when um what's his name is like, oh, if we had the power of like vibranium, what would we do? And she was like, I dream of it every day. And I was like, that's evil. Yeah. There we go. Right there. That's- I think one of the most bold things this movie did was give the U.S. no space to be the hero at all. Mm-hmm. In fact, even the one white Finally. guy who like supposed to like. He doesn't even save anybody. He's actually rescued. And but and the U.S. institutions themselves are at no point given any space to like actually be good or actually save anyone. And that is brave as hell. Yeah. It, yeah. But it's interesting, though, too, because at the end of the day, who does end up having the battle against each other? It's the two brown communities yeah. while mm-hmm. everyone else yeah. kind of sits back, which, you know, mirrors outside of this movie. You know, it's funny because there's yeah. between yeah. Yeah. between political stuff and a lot recent time there's been this huge crazy nonsensical debate on like who created hip-hop which unfortunately has caused minor division between you know like latino and black communities and this is a whole other podcast that we don't need to get into so i was kind of thinking about that too about how you know Mm. this division between the you know i'm using quote you know black and brown coalition how you know yeah like you're saying the french american white american as the face of america in this movie yeah, they're like the bad guys, but at the end of the day, the people who kill each other are the brown folks. You, you know what I'm saying? So but, that's yeah. also very yeah. But I also like that. I mean, I think I, I and I, I feel like at some point in the movie when when the when they had the second battle, and I was that is exactly what hit me. I was like, okay, this we're now just seeing people who are trying to not be colonized, essentially threatening to annihilate each other. Each other, and for what for what reason? Who's it going to serve? And what's wild is it's not even that other people watched. No one knew about it. Mm. oh people man like, i didn't even think about that yeah, they don't even one. know about it they're, about they're, they're just funny. like oh wow. there's something weird happening they don't even know you know what kind of so secretive sure, sure no one knows sure. that the one has been attacked sure, um sure. they know that the queen but, died and that's it and and they were blaming the wakandans for everything that's right yeah. like, like if something also, happened so. yeah, if there was something yeah. that happened oh it had to be the wakandans it had to be the wakandans because they didn't even know about the underwater yeah. community tribe yeah. and society because what does it matter what and the only moment in which they discovered quote unquote this new tribe and group was because they were trying to mine more vibranium that they had located underwater right yeah. and so you only see people if they have what you want think about that yep. i only see you if you have what i want if you do not have what i want i don't even see you that is the brownest narrative that i have ever seen on a screen before I only see you if you have what I want to take from you. Wow. Wow. And I was really struck. I was just like, oh, there's like, wow, we're just getting full on blatant, um, you know, whatever. Colonizing society is extractive. That's all they're doing. (laughs) They're not contributing Mm -hmm. anything to the ocean. They are literally there to take something out. Damage be damned. Well, something that's sad to... I was just going to say, what's sad to me is that Eventually, the way in which it is determined that Namor can be taken down is to literally dry him out and get rid Mm -hmm. of the water and to put him in a place where there is no ability for him to breathe in the way that he needs to breathe. So we have these two elements going on that are also from the real world, the idea of climate change and losing water and access to water, and also this other idea of not being able to breathe. And yeah. and having that be taken away from you, there was the most beautiful moment to me was when Cherie stops and has that flashback where she sees the convergence of how she got here. Right. Like we have these moments where we get into crisis, where we say you're to blame. No, you're to blame. And then there's a whole nother way of looking at situations where you say, no, how did we get here? And how we got here is how Cherie then determines I'm not going to play this in this particular way. Because we got here to this place of wanting to kill each other for the sake of living, because that is what we've been taught is how you fight and how you win. 
And that is not the way that we have learned how to actually create and cultivate and continue to thrive. And so I'm actually curious much later on in this conversation when we're going to talk about organic versus synthetic power, organic versus synthetic vibranium. Because my biggest fear now in the foreshadowing is that if smart, amazing, brilliant, young Black women can come up with the way to create synthetic vibranium, that's where the white people, that's where the U.S. and the French and the colonizers, the good colonizers, the bad colonizers, that's what they want. They don't have the brains for it, so they're still trying to mine it. But once they figure out how to continue to purchase it like they were starting to, this is a problem. And that scene you're talking about, that's what left me the most conflicted because it's true. But then there's also an act that no more commits where it's like, I don't know, is there any coming back from this? You know what I mean? So, right. Yeah. When you kill the, when you kill Ramonda, it's like right. the queen. Yeah. Or the mother, the queen. It's like, I don't know. And then, and that, and that ties back to what I was saying earlier. Then it's like, so then you are bad. You are a villain, but then, oh, but wait, you're kind of not because you got this other thing going on. So I get it. I understand this all goes back to like, oh, things are complicated. Things aren't perfect. And that's cool. But it would be nice to kind of like cheer for somebody getting their due. And Mm -hmm. essentially the real people didn't get their their due, whether it be like we're talking about earlier, the French government, the American government, or, you know, the guy that killed this innocent, you know, killed killed this innocent woman. So that's part of the reason why I'd like uh in going forward in the future like a, a super villain a really evil diabolical person maybe we'll get that and maybe not but that's also a personal thing i'll, I'll say it again I'm, I'm pretty literal minded for the most part especially when it comes to these movies so it is what it is yeah i understand it is nice to have less nuance with your villains and just know who to cheer for um yeah but we can all i think agree that the the real villains were the white people and it was nice oh, to not see a lot of yeah. them it was just nice yeah. to not have a lot of them on screen. Yeah, yeah, I think I think what you're right. It just what frustrates me is like one of them wasn't like the one that threw the, the those water bombs that right. killed Andrew. It almost like I want them to be the ones to right. do it. You know what I mean? Right. Because again, the more did this really terrible thing, but then it's like, well, I don't know. It, it, it what you're going to war, you're going to battle, so these kind of things happen, unfortunately. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, as you can tell, as I talk, I'm still kind of mulling it over. Um, so. I, mean, I mean, the the thing that's challenging, right, is that they left these two folks who were held hostage until they could come to an agreement on their alliance. Yeah, left, and so he was like, "Oh, so you're gonna leave? Okay, so my my threats to you were nothing." So there's there's so much in there. I wish that I could have been sharing the whole time. And in fact, every time I saw the trailer for it, I was like, no, no, no. What are you doing? Why would we create a film where black and brown people are are against each other mm-hmm. at odds? We have a real enemy and those real enemies do things to undermine us so that we can be at at, at odds with one another. Then, you know, I'm from Southern California. You have a really huge thing in real life happening just like this on the L.A. City Council. Right. Sure, like, so sure, I, and, and, yeah. and then this film comes out. Right. I'm like, this is not what we need right now. <laughs> and and so and so it's super frustrating as as a brown person to see something. And as a brown person who has, you know, a, a blended family where yeah. there are black and brown people. Sure. And 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 they're both right. There are multicultural people in my family, and which one are they choosing? Which one are they having to cheer <laughs> right. for? Yeah, yeah. And 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 you know, Phil is the villain mm-hmm. or not? And for me, I just felt like why couldn't why couldn't the the Lacan people no more be introduced in their own film, get their own backstory? Yeah. And I, I had show flashes of that myself. I I, mm-hmm. I I was thinking that yeah myself. Um, yeah, yeah, but um. And that's the thing, too. I guess we've already talked about spoilers. And that's the thing, too. The way the movie ends, you know, with like, well, first the battle ends and you see them kind of standing with each other and bowing down. But then the real ending is not necessarily a solidarity between Namar when he's talking to his, his like his second in command. You know, he's like, hey, we, you know, like we're, we're playing. He essentially said we're playing chess right now. So that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, yeah, he's truly buddy buddy with the Wakandans, because the other thing we haven't even mentioned yet was. To kind of make, I think, to make the audience, it didn't work for me, but to kind of make the audience think this guy is really more of a villain was that he, you know, he had another plan too. He wanted to take out the people 
on land as well. Like it was one of those things where he had this one plan that he wanted to achieve. And then once he got rid of the scientists who created the vibranium, you want, what did he call them? The land walkers or pe- people on, of, the surface the, dwellers, surface dwellers, the surface dwellers. So, yeah. Yeah, you want to yeah, do that? That, which that is always like kind has been what he's called them in the comics. Yeah, surface dwellers, which is his way of just like I want to, I want to start here, and then I want to just take over more and more and more. So I think, I think that's what they're trying to do. But still, I, mm-hmm. I, I didn't. It, it sounds crazy. It didn't bother me as much because, like I said, he, I'm conflicted with him because I understand why he is the way he is. I so, thought him no, so I, sympathetic. So even when he was yeah, talking right, about his plan to like yeah. kill the surface dwellers, I was kind of like, oh, this isn't just. Of course, I mean, I'm putting full air quotes all around this, but like just genocide. It's like it's, <laughs> it's preventative genocide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No yeah. Sense. yeah but it yeah. wasn't no. because he wasn't like, oh, I need to. He was just like, they're encroaching. They're too close. They're like yeah. here. This is what we need to do, because if yeah. they uncover us first, we're going to be in the less powerful position. Like his logic was sound. It was just diabolical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to connect this sort of back to this way this connects with the comics and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I, I, I had, I was really worried about this movie for the reasons you guys outlined. Like I was like, I really do not need to see black and brown people fighting on the screen right now. And I was relieved at how it kind of brought communities together in the end through that. But like I, in the comics, like historically, Namor has always been a character who shows up and has conflict with other groups of protagonists. He is an antagonist, but he's like a sympathetic antagonist. Mm. Um, so like he'll team up with the good guys to fight the Nazis and he's, he, he, and it, which, which was great. Lots of lovely panels of him punching Nazis. Um, but he, uh, he always priority is always protecting his people and, mm. um, it's presented fairly sympathetically and it's sometimes shown like how this is going to put, this just puts him in contact with the priorities of the surface world. And he's one of those things where fans have always kind of been like, I know he's the antagonist, but like, isn't he right? Like, and that dates back to through the comics. So I want to give a little bit of history. Um, the Submariner is one of the first superheroes ever created. Um, he was by artist and writer Bill Everett. Um, and uh, he's always been characterized as being an outsider from the other characters because he's only, he's half uh, Atlantean and half human. So he's sort of been this like bicultural character who has to straddle these two different worlds. When people were like talking about in the beginning of the MCU, like which characters it would make a lot of sense to have be uh, played by actress of color and sort of have cross-racial casting. Namor was always on the short list because he has always positioned himself as being an outsider who is misunderstood by white hegemony in the society. Like that has always been his role in the comics. And um, so a lot of fans had kind of headcanoned him as being like, uh, as looking like Asian, East Asian specifically. Um, so, but it's total. I mean, I think people are totally down for him being Mesoamerican and specifically Mayan instead. But like there, but this has been a thing that fans had been looking to have for a long time. Um, but like it, 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 his role in comics has been to get in fights with other heroes and then make peace with them and then go on to like fight the real bad guy. And mm-hmm. like that's also right. it, been true in 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 this. Like this, like you know, when I was worried about those conflicts in the series i was like yeah but what does man no more do he fights with the good guys and then they team up like that's what that's what they do fights with the bag the good guys and then team up the one the, I, and i think as someone who's like read him in comics many many times i feel like the one difference in his actual characterization between his 1939 debut and what we see today like the one difference is that comics no more would have totally tried to solve the problem by seducing Ramonda before attempting any other any other form of conflict resolution. Now, she would have not gone for it. She would have had none of that. But Comics No More, his approach to problem solving often involves trying to seduce women in power um, and make peace that way. Like, that's just one of his main moves. Which we um, could have seen. We could yeah. have seen more, but she <laughs> left. You know, she they they both ran away and left. And and the thing that I just want to point out, Alana, is that we were talking about Atlantis. This character already existed, but they weren't connected with a a Mesoamerican place, indigenous place. And the things that they used, much like Wakandan, you know, um, were real, you know, like Kukuklan Mm -hmm. is a real serpent feather god to the Mayan people. You know, you go to Chichen Itza, which is in the Yucatan Peninsula. And you can see the serpent, the feathered serpent there, you know, beautifully made in, you know, the 
um, the ruins there. And there is a ball game that is also played as they go down into, you know, the area where Namor is from. You see all these people playing this like very well-known pits or book that book, soccer and basketball type Mayan game. Like there's all these very clearly Mayan specific Mesoamerican mm-hmm. elements to Namor now, to the point where he explains that his name Namor is short for no amor, no love for the land and for, you know, the, the non water area of the planet. And I just feel like, you know, why couldn't we have maybe picked also some other you know, character like Black Panther, you know, got developed in a way, but it was it was such that Black Panther already existed and was black. Namor was not brown, was not, you know, Mesoamerican. And so they added all these things to it. And that's where things get really funky for me, because of all the now, if you count Namor, now 51 Latino superheroes, most of them are in DC Comics. If you want to know more, you can read a book called Latinx Superheroes in Mainstream Comics by Frederick Luis Aldama. But they're Mm. mostly in DC and not necessarily in Marvel. And so I just find it very weird that this was the character that you chose Namor to be the one that you're going to transform into a brown Mesoamerican character. Mm. Yeah. Wow. But like having Namor be white doesn't make sense anymore is the thing. I mean, I think that there's a question about like, is, you know, why is it an antihero or like, why is it a character who's frequently at odds with everyone else? But like, I, I don't think that like having a white no more, like, like, I don't even think well, that would make sense now. It, well, I know, but it's, but what you've just described, right? And I want people to really listen to this. You just described Namor as the original Marvel character being kind of the the ladies' man as a way of like, you know, uh, calming things or dealing with conflict. What kind Mm -hmm. of a stereotype and trope is that for the Latin lover who like can seduce people? Like, what is that? Like, what is going on? I also think that they probably to lead into that um, in this depiction. Um, yeah. Again, I'm not at all ever going to defend Marvel against a person, <laughs> but, oh. but I feel like um, I actually, you know, and again, I, I I don't feel necessarily that I can speak to this against you, I, but I did like that it was grounded in a culture that we don't see much of in pop culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I do hear your your comments and I do agree. I wish that it had not been in an anti-hero or they hadn't played up his anti-hero um, since they're rewriting the character anyway, they could have made him a little more, a little less some um, anti-hero-ish. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I did think it was beautiful to like visually see depictions of this, this culture that we just don't see in pop culture very much. Oh, we're desperate in the Brown indigenous communities. We'll take it all. We'll take them yeah. all in any way, shape or form. The more we can get, the more we can then start to say, well, how about like this now? And how about like that? Like this mm-hmm. is yeah. the yeah. last 10 years have been fantastic from Coco to Encanto to this to even seeing, you know, Wakanda, the first one. You think the first Wakanda didn't have a bunch of brown folks, folks at the theater saying, yes, yes. You know, like right. we will take whatever we can get in terms of seeing People Mm -hmm. of color on screen, taking back power, utilizing their own power, not being colonized and showing how great and brilliant we are. I was going to say, and that's the part too, the like leaning into actual authentic cultural references, right? Not just like Mm -hmm. made up white people ideas of what, of of what these (laughs) cultures are or look like. Like, I think that I like that about the first Black Panther and ongoing, how they just chose a language, right? (laughs) An African language. And they're like, this is what they speak as opposed to like. Uh, whatever the minions are speaking or or just making up something oh. or making them only speak in yeah. English. I think that right. these sort of choices are, are for me, just interesting as a Black person who just wants to see more of, you know, Black and brown people in the world in pop culture um, in a way that celebrates their culture. And I, I totally get like how some of the, you know, the way that Namor was depicted could definitely be offensive. And, um, and I get that, but I was still happy to see him. I mean, the actor... Tenoch, uh, you know, Huerta Mejia, you know, they're, they were also featured and well known from the television show Narcos. Again, Narcos, not mm. necessarily the best representation of brown people, but multiple seasons and at least we're there. 
So, you know, we, we are we are regularly playing the villains, mm-hmm. regularly trying to show that there's a rationale or reason behind why we yeah. might be angry, vilified um, and trying to take something or defend something. Both these communities and cultures, whether it's the Tolacan or the Wakandans, are literally hidden in plain sight, yep. whether it's in the air or underwater. You know, like, I think for me, the takeaway of this film was we have more in common than not. Mm-hmm. And we have common enemies. And how we began is not necessarily how we're going to end. And that if we can get back to our own indigenous roots and community and sovereignty, then it's possible that that return to is actually the future. And I really, again, wanted to just put a finer point on the, yeah, hidden in plain sight, like they're there, right? And they just happen to have technology to hide them. And so they are uninteresting uh, to colonizers until they are. I think one of the many reasons they not think they didn't go for a romantic situation is because Namor is like a million trillion years old, right? Even though he doesn't look it. Um, and so I think that, people would have been uncomfortable with it. But like there was really some, um, you know, there's some question that some folks had about the decision to situate his people as having come from the past. But it's also, they also have a lot of technology too. They have vibranium, I guess, which is like, yeah. the, you know, which is the, the sort of I thing mean, that almost validates these um, more ancient societies right it's like oh they are doing what they're doing because they have this like space metal i mean the most beautiful thing that i saw actually is that they were wearing masks okay we are still in the pandemic (laughs) and mask wearing has been a really big deal and you know for folks who go to different parts of latin america mexico in particular you know they still wear masks um you know like all over the place and so for me i was like and look who's wearing masks even in the movie (laughs) <laughs> um, now, mind you, those masks were like technologically, how did they make them? They're special masks that non Namor isn't wearing it because he doesn't need to. He is of a particular yeah. kind of person, right? He has his mom who ingested the vibranium, you know, organically, and he's, you know, in the womb at the time. So he can live on land and on water and doesn't need the mask. But so can the other people of Talocan because they wear these masks that allow them to breathe out of water. And if you look closely or we're able to see it, the mask has like little water in it, right? So they're like yeah. speaking through a mask mm-hmm. that has water in it. That's how they're able to I, stay yeah. there. I really hope that cosplayers consider that as a, a mask option. Oh, I'm like, sure they will. It, it's so cool. Not going to, around. You know I mean? I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they yeah, will. Yeah. Um, rather than just getting COVID spreading everywhere. Well, we and, we, and the other not- women, the, the other women of the Lacan, you know, Nora Namora. Uh, there's other yeah. there's other versions of Nora Mora. There's Nora Mora, and then there's a younger one too. These are these are cousins, you know. So also too to see the fact that like cousins are in leadership together and throwing down together, like that family, you know, um, is also pretty interesting in the film. You know, I wonder what's going to happen to Nora uh, Namora. Um, if she's going to have yeah. a role. She's the one who comes out at the end and is like, why didn't you kill her right. um, to Marcus's earlier point? Right. And he's and so I'm wondering, like, is she actually more intense than Namora? Is Namora really yes. the one to look at? <laughs> if this is the comics. Yes. Uh, um, if we're I yeah, love I'm that sure. we're now talking about yeah. side characters because I really loved the Okoye and the and the Warriors ongoing oh. um, banter. I thought that that was really charming. Um, yeah. The way that yeah. they kept challenging each other. And it was clearly. I mean, they were willing to murder each other, but there was also a playful quality to it that um, I, I thought lightened up some of the y'all. There was a clearly, scenes. there was a clearly queer love story in this film too. We haven't even touched on that. They, they were hoping we wouldn't. <laughs> well, but the movie barely touches on it. To, 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 to be fair, they do it almost. I, yeah. I think sometimes Marvel movies. What's I'm not gonna put on Marvel. I think a lot of movies these days in general treat non-white things as like checklists sometimes and as someone who's like i'm a black guy myself you know and i have friends of many different genders and that and and races and nationalities so this is conversations that comes up a lot it sometimes it does feel like do we have the black person latino person the asian person the the gay character that okay we got it all so everyone's like that like that's how it feels like it's not even organic it's more just like we we need to appease people. We, on need, Twitter, we have our Benetton uh, commercial. Or, or, We've right, got it. It's here. Right. No. Exactly. Like that's kind of and, and it's so, and it puts like someone like myself 
in a position where sometimes like, why even put it in then? But then I, but then I'm on the side of like, why put anything other than just make it all white? And then I'm like, well, that's not what I mean. It's just kind of like, if you're going to do something like that, then like, don't just like treat it like, uh, Hey, Hey, you saw we did this thing. Right. Right. So, so, so did, did we pass? Do we have the diversity thing? Like, right. that's just how it feels sometimes. But as, then as a it, bald you know, brown queer woman, mm-hmm. I appreciate oh, well. <laughs> anything and everything. Again, Fair. I'll take all of it. And if we're just a side character, that's OK. Just normalize it. It's just normal to see us. And we're just we can be on the side. I'll take any and all location as long and as that's, it's on the screen. And that's the complex thing that I'm thinking of, because it's like that again. It doesn't have to be you don't have to add another hour into the movie to explore this whole like, you know, uh romance. So what you're saying is true also, like just put it in. I just sometimes hope that they don't think that that's all mm-hmm. we want. Yeah. Like, okay, th- yeah. All right. So they'll just be satisfied with this. So this is all we're going to do from now on. Like sometimes like, you know, yeah. push it's okay to push back to uh and I'm not saying you know, I'm just saying in general, because I've heard other people say like and going back to since man, since I don't know about the beginning of the time, beginning of time, I was only born in, in 1981, but, but to, to the Latino thing for a moment, I've always heard like we're rarely re- 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 represented. I've, I've been hearing this for decades since I was a little kid. So this isn't yeah. anything new, which I think is a problem. I think that's a, a whole, you know, it speaks to a bigger issue. So just, I, I feel like I understand what you're saying, because even I feel that way sometimes, too. But it's just like, ho- hopefully this will be bigger. And and to your point about Namora, I think overall, even though this last phase of Marvel stuff has just been really bad and looked cheap uh, outside of Black Panther. Um, what I like about the incorporation of the movies into the show is like they're bringing back everyone. It's like someone from a 2010 movie shows up in a series now or someone from, you know, one of the earlier movies shows up in a later movie now. So it's totally not outside that Namora could get like a spinoff show or she could be like mm-hmm. a main supporting character in a future yeah. movie or show or something like that. So, so the future does look positive based on, 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 on what they're doing. I also want to say that too, that Black Panther didn't look cheap. No. Were there any particular pits up that bits of costuming and were stage production that really like struck you and in, in, in terms of those designs marcus because i agree with you like this movie actually looks like somebody i mean they, somebody actually cares it's not just well, to, well like what well, to get with know, the set design crap. like when they're walking around well first of all i mean the underwater world looked great and then um walking around wakanda it didn't feel cheap in comparison to just a few months ago when they're walking around in thor love and thunder it just looked like a bad yeah. video game. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. the same similar budget, same resources, but you just see the difference between Wakanda yeah. forever and something like Thor Lo- Lo- love and thunder. So obviously the costumes and all stuff are always great. Um, it's funny. I went to the, to the uh, same alma mater as the, uh, the designer from the first film. I went to Hampton university. No pun intended. She's like a superhero in, in the world of Hampton university. Cause she won the Academy award and everything. But um, yeah, I think that's what stood out to me most is that I didn't feel like uh it didn't feel like cardboard cutout kind of like, yeah. uh, so, so that was a breath of fresh air. Cause it, it it's, things have been looking kind of grim recently, except, except for like, well, WandaVision. Cause that, but that was intentional. The look of yeah, that right. was like intentional, but anyway. I, I just really want to hit on what, what Marcus was just saying in terms of like, well, superhero, but were they, that happened again, the character of Riri, who is the student at MIT, right? Who makes all these things and then comes and helps. That is a non-superhero who becomes a superhero, much like Luis from Ant-Man, who we've talked about before a lot. You know, like for me, I'm like, Luis is the real superhero in Ant-Man. He's the only other time I've seen a brown, legitimate Latinx character in the MCU universe was with Luis. And Ant-Man is my favorite of all the, the superheroes in the MCU universe. But just for reassuring folks, yeah, like, Mary sure. Williams is a superhero in Marvel. Iron Heart, she's yeah. Ironheart. She, like, has a whole a whole super... Eve, Eve Ewing actually was writing the series recently. Um, and I was curious what folks thought about how the movie did introduce her. But, like, yeah, but, like, do not fret. Like, this, she's going to be leading her own movie, I'm sure, very soon. But, like, she was designed, like, to be a, a superhero character basically they definitely changed her some up in some interesting ways had her powers because she 
she's really smart and she synthesized the missing herb. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The smartness got her there. Oh, but I think one thing that's good actually is in the comics, Riri Williams is super tied to Tony Stark, which I just felt ridiculous to me. And thankfully in this, she is not tied to Tony Stark. She's like, you know, she, she becomes more connected to the Wakandans rather than Tony who like is just, you know, a rich guy who needs to stop. Right. So I think that's going to be a positive. Yeah, I, I wonder if down the line, Luis from Ant-Man is going to meet up with the Talakana Namor and have I something there, too, to connect him. Mm. Who knows? You know, I mean, there are really endless possibilities. I guess one critical question I would have, though, is my understanding is that a lot of the filming of this was done around um Letitia Wright not wanting to get vaccinated and so they were trying to reduce some of like the contact what, between her and some of the other performers I, was I don't know to what into that I couldn't find real evidence of that but I remember hearing chatter I know she was okay. injured at some so part not of the film and so she did have to get Ooh. away from everyone because she had in filming she'd like re- had an injury and so oh, I think no. that knocked her out of the out of the filming for a couple months and people did have to record around her absence. I couldn't see it directly Around in that. a way tied mm. to like the anti-vax stance that they've definitely said she has. But I'm again, I feel like without like researching that on my own, I just feel like they talk, but ba- people get talked badly about. And I'm not saying she hasn't said anything. Yeah. I just yeah. haven't heard her well, say it. What, what, what it's not, well, not so much her saying it. What happened was, and they got deleted. <clears throat> she tweeted a video about the vaccine being bad. And she tweeted it at a, at, it was like at the start of COVID, where everybody was sensitive and everything, you know what I mean? So she immediately got pushed back from it and then she deleted the tweet and then she just got off Twitter altogether. It was just one of those things where like, you should be able to tweet whatever, whatever you want, but it, it was just an odd time to do it. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm really not ju- judging her because, you know, it, it is what it is. But then, yeah, there was something. It was one of those things where, if when you just say it was reported, suddenly it just gives it right. validity. So I, I don't know. In twenty twenty two, there's so many like resources and stuff can still be yeah. incorrect. Versus, you know, mm-hmm. think about you know, think about like pre internet when just how many wrong things were reported and people went to their graves believing something that wasn't even like kind of half true, but just absolutely wrong to like figure that out but she did disappear from the filming for some time and it's reported that she right. sustained an injury in filming which kind of kept her away for a while i didn't notice a mm-hmm. distinct absence but i also wasn't looking for that i mean we do know that there's certainly one really big absence that the film was of course entirely written developed and changed to address which is the app the absence of a real human and I was really curious to see how the movie was going to handle Chadwick Boseman's death as both the Black Panther's death and yeah. the real person. Yeah, I folks yeah. feel the movie love that. that it started with the funeral for us. I just feel like that was yeah. really um, nice and definitely like making space for for the audience who obviously most of us are not friends with Chadwick and did not go to his funeral. <laughs> and so just yeah. to have a moment where we could, as the audience, like not just sort of like he's dead, but actually get a full beautiful funeral and be able to like cry through that and then and then also recognize that like the kingdom is mourning in the way that we also like mourn his absence here in this film yeah I thought, I, yeah and it's there's something there's almost like it, it's weird to say it's like there's like a community feeling around black panther i think it did feel like you know the world mourned when he passed away so i think I'm not going to say this movie could have done whatever because it did handle it well, but I think people were fine with it. You know what I mean? When a character passes, like that's something. But when the actual person behind the character and the character passes, I think the the world was going to give it some leeway. And it's just like, well, this is just it. it, it it's an unfortunate event, and it just kind of is what it is, unfortunately. So, um, but with all that being said, yeah, I think Ryan Coogler and Marvel handled it well. You know, and everyone going Look, into it knew right. what to expect. I think everyone going in knew essentially what to expect. I so. didn't. I just had not thought it How? through. I didn't expect a funeral. I like oh. and I like I did. I That's said weird. that with my know. friend and she was like, I'm prepared to cry. And I was like, cry. Why? <laughs> it's like literally minutes before the movie started. And I was like, oh, right. We are, right. in fact, mourning the titular characters uh, and the actor death. Um, and so I was like, oh, this is really beautiful that they've given us a funeral. Thanks. 
I, I mean, how many different spider men, actors and characters and versions do we have? And we will only have one of T'Challa. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that that speaks volumes to Chadwick's and Ryan's work to make this mm-hmm. film and make this character and have it be embodied by a particular actor who played it in such a way where I never even questioned whether or not Black Panther was a real person when I saw mm-hmm. the first, you know, film. Yeah. Yeah. And so there, who else could possibly step in? Who else could possibly pick up the mantle? And in the comic book, we knew that Cherie eventually would be the Black Panther. Yeah. So it was a it was a natural progression to go in that particular way. What I thought was interesting is that I never saw in the comic book series and backstory that T'Challa got sick, that T'Challa got some kind of an illness. That never was something that I had any knowledge of. But in the film, they make it very clear that he got some kind of a sickness and fell ill like the like like Chadwick did in real life. So, Alana, I'm, mm, I'm curious right. if you want to give us some backstory to that. How did in the comic book series T'Challa die? Was it an oh, illness? No, I, I I don't remember off the top of my head, but truly, I'm sure I was battling bad guys. Like because that's right, so what so happens. so in this particular yeah. version, right, the battle is with the bad guys of some sort of illness. So they they blended that storyline so that we also were, were like, wait, Black Panther was sick, much like mm-hmm. in real life. We were like, what Chadwick was sick. And so that sort of like convergence of the real, the fiction and the nonfiction was really beautiful for me that you would acknowledge that and that that you couldn't undo that. See, that that those two characters, that the real life Chadwick and T'Challa were so enmeshed that you could not possibly disconnect them in life and death, either one. And so I, I felt like that was actually a really beautiful way to sort of say no one else can ever play this character in this particular way. And yet Mm. at the end of the film, we have this child who bears the exact Mm -hmm. name. And so there is the possibility of a return to, but knowing that it's not going to be played by a different actor who's going to claim to be that character. Also, they did a really good job of transitioning us to our new Panther. Um. And I like that the yeah, arc was like she had started her whatever journey to the new heart shaped herb, trying to save her brother and failing. I thought that that there was something about that that I thought was really really beautiful too. Yeah. Um. Yeah i I don't know that I've seen a movie really address the death of an actor in this way. Like you know, The Crow very famously, the lead actor got shot during a stunt in that movie, and the movie. While the movie The Crow is very much about life after death, I don't really think it dealt. It's been a while since I've seen it, but I, I don't really s- felt like it really seriously dealt with that. I saw that. I, for, I vaguely remember seeing that, and I feel like they just edited around. They just took what footage they had, I yeah. was and there was say, no acknowledgement yeah. that the actor <clears throat> was, was dead. Well, it was, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, in oh, the movie. movie, yeah. the, movie. I, it, the, the, yeah. the movie itself. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, it was like in June. Yeah, the, the, the general consensus. It was just like, hey, we yeah. got to finish this. Like that, that, and it that, was that the, is the same in the Fast and, and the Furious. That, that yeah, that, at least oh, in Fast yeah. and the Furious, they had like uh, you know, the oh, I'll see you again kind of thing. You know, like at least they did the whole superimposed face. But, they, thing but where, I think where they, they brought his off, brother in still... to finish the film. <laughs> so true. like it yeah, was sort yeah, of yeah, they yeah, still. True. I don't know. I think that they still did it in the same way. Acknowledged that like, yeah. at least he's dead. At least like with the crow, there was two more crow movies after each with a different actor playing them you know what i mean so it was almost like hey we gotta churn out this uh series you know it's also weird because the eric mabius he's from my hometown he played he played the crow in in, in the crow oh. three so you're connected to all the people <laughs> huh from- marcus everyone <laughs> yes it's a- amherst amherst just produces uh you know you got uh my boy Evan, he's on the Bear, and he was in Girls. You got Uma oh. Thurman, Dinosaur Junior. Uh, yeah, Amherst for Emma's a small town. So good in Andor. Oh my god. For, uh, yeah, for a small yeah, town, I, we got some. <laughs> we got some cool. Oh, Evan's in the MCU. Actually, he was in. He was. Yeah. Uh, he was in Punisher. So he's, he's in MCU. Yep. Also. <laughs> he's great in everything. Yeah. But yeah. Like I, I just don't know that. I think it's almost. I feel like it's almost a landmark in cinema. What this movie did in terms of addressing the real human mm-hmm. being's death through the fictional character's death. Mr. Hooper's death on Sesame Street, I feel like is the only other time I can think of. Like, And that mm. was done as a children's show, as moral instruction and emotional mm-hmm. instruction, so to speak, actually really addressing the death of a real person through the story they're telling on screen. Um, yeah. 
But what's super interesting in all of this is that, you know, the name of the film is Wakanda Forever. And at the same time, much of the the posters leading up to things showed this Black Panther mask and sort of like, you know, um, your whole outfit and suit. And you were like, oh, is it Cherie? Is it Cherie? What is it? You know, like, is it is it about, you know, T'Challa? And I think that, you know, we wouldn't have another Black Panther if Cherie hadn't created the synthetic Absolutely. vibranium. So we mm. we might not have ever had another Black Panther, but we still would have had Wakanda. And yeah. I think I'm I'm curious what you all think mm. about, like, why didn't they just call? Why didn't they could have called it so many different things? Why was it still called Wakanda forever and not Black Panther 2 or something else? Like, why Wakanda forever? I, I'm well, actually curious what the three of you I think I think about it's because why. everyone liked saying that. <laughs> That, but I think it ties to Chad Wilson. I think it's about, I mean, this sounds such a generic thing to say, but it also has meaning where it's just like his spirit will go on. Like everything we're talking about, the fact that they're never going to make a, another T'Challa, you, you know, like it, that character that Chad Wilson played. And I think outside of yeah, people like saying, it, I think it's just kind of like continuing on his legacy. Like he carried not just that movie, like he carried the Black Panther mantle for a couple of films, you, you know what I mean? And and going back to what Alana said, he, he did such a good job at it. He's just synonymous with the character. So I think that's probably what that means. It's just a way to honor him and say, yeah, his, his physical is no longer here, but his spirit will always be here, you know? And, and that, and to some degree, we kind of get that in the post credit scene, mid mid credit scene rather. Also, also so. the idea that like, we, I yeah. think, I think a lot of us fell in love with Wakanda in Black Panther one, right? Like, I mean, we yeah, like the sure. character of Black Panther in the in the other movies he sure. was in. But once we went to Wakanda, everyone was like, "Oh my gosh, Wakanda is incredible! I want to visit." Um, and I and I um, also, I mean, I don't really, I didn't read much kind of leading up to it, but I did myself just wonder, like, how are they going to handle this? Who's going to be the Black Panther? I mean, it is Black Panther too, so we knew someone would, but I wasn't sure if it would be Shuri, some random someone out of nowhere, um, Mbaku who has clearly mellowed out in his old age. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like all of these, I was, I was just kid. I was interested until basically until Shuri took the herb, who was going to be our Black Panther. Um, and so how do you present that? You know, I don't know. I think Wakanda forever still places us firmly in Wakanda, which is mostly where we wanted to go. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I um, do want to mm-hmm. mention these last two things before we, we close out Alana. You know, the the actor who played uh, Namor did not know how to swim prior to uh, making uh, the film. No way. So had, to, what a brown so had to learn how to swim uh, and and clearly had to learn also how to fly. Um, so I'm just going to add that uh, in uh, uh, as something. That is new but, for all of us. Yes. yes. But then the other thing, too, that I think is super important and is also incredibly powerful is that the Latinx actors in the cast asked Ryan, please give us a hand signal and a call. There's something to what happens in the outside of this fictional world and the longevity of the power of this film, that if there is a Wakanda light across the chest, you know, and a phrase like Wakanda forever, if there's something that we can have as the uh, as our people, that would be great. And so they have this hand sign, you know, this like lower hand and upper hand. And that's right. supposed yeah, to yeah, symbolize yeah. the mouth of a serpent. Just so, so just so that we know some background. I wonder what that meant, but I did love this. Oh, I Oh, yes, yeah, so it's this know. whole thing for me. I was telling my mom who I saw the movie with my mom. I was like, it's like playing catch. You're trying to catch something and you're trying mm. to say, I'm, I'm here to catch it, but it's actually a mouth, a uh, serpent's mouth, but they asked for it. So that was not part of the film. That was not part mm. of the plan. The actors had to ask for it. So I think there's something too is uh, uh, as well of, of people acknowledging that the film is so powerful and folks are going to see it. They need to take something away as well to say, I'm a part of this community. I acknowledge this. I'm a part of this. And so I'm actually curious to see how far that's actually going to go much like uh, Wakanda and gestures and things have also happened uh, post the first one. That's really insightful. Um, Wow. So I'm going to sort of, Oof, one of them is actually probably too big for this. I will try to. Um, do you folks feel like this movie had a directorial voice that you could, that was distinct, you know, within the movie franchise that you would point to as being like, oh, that's Ryan Coogler? I, 
I think knows. so. I, I think no matter what, across the board, there's always going to be. I mean, it, it's just the fact that most directors have said we do this much and then in po- you know what I mean. But I think just I, I'm just going to be general. The the blackness of the film, I definitely think, is consistent with Ryan Coogler's non Marvel films. Um, the present, the surprise presence of um, M- Michael B. Jordan, which it's clear how much those two guys love each other. <laughs> like it's like they have to make movies together. Um, mm-hmm. So it's like so it's like. I think I guess my answer to that is as as much as possible, because, you know, I felt that way with um, going back to Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness. It part parts of it absolutely felt like a Sam Ra- Raimi film like there, there. It felt like direct homages to scenes from Evil Dead, Drag Me to Hell, stuff it like that. It was a horror yeah. film. That was definitely a horror it, it film. It absolutely was. Even non Sam Raimi references, like there's a whole chase scene that's similar to The Shining. This is a scene where she emerges from the flames covered in blood, which felt like a scene, you know, the prom scene from Carrie. But um, I think no matter what, there's always going to be that Marvel because everything is so, I've been saying this again, it's so connected that everything does kind of have to look similarly no matter what the director, you, you know. So I guess as much as possible in these kinds of movies, I guess that that's, I that's think my that, answer. that the sort of the, the, blo- the marquee, directors in MCU do have visions, even when you were talking about what you didn't like about Thor Love and Thunder. I feel like that's Taika Waititi's cheesiness that we saw, right? Yeah. Like, it, it looked cheap so because cheesy, that's what he wanted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wish he went, because he's such a good, you know, I I, I do, because like, God, man, Hunt for the Wilder People and, and stuff like that are just so good. Um, Thor Love and Thunder podcast, but I actually did like the movie. <laughs> but I think, did you? Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I think that, that Alternatively, I think I think especially when Ryan Coogler does Black Panther, it is just very cinematic and very lush, right? And I feel like there are some yeah. touches that he did, like you know, we're home every time everybody returns to Wakanda uh, for whatever reason. Okoyo has to say we're home, and like that, yeah, I love I it. Her. I love every time yeah. she does it. I feel like I'm home. Um, do you guys get that? I want to go visit Wakanda. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, I can give you yeah, instructions. I'm, I'm like, is Virgin fly there yet? Um, but no, I feel like there were some like repeats of things that we'd seen um, that were grounding us in Wakanda as Ryan Coogler imagines it. And I wonder if he leaves the franchise, how much of that will be retained? I hope he doesn't. I mean, like, at least, and I think that says something to his touch on the movies. You know, I think it's also understated how young he is in comparison to other directors. Like even when he made Fruitvale Station, he was like 23 years old and that movie's still not even 10 years old. That movie came out in 2013. So he's still a young guy and he was a film school guy. So if anyone listening, if you can track down, I, I, I don't know where you get the archives from, but his interview with Elvis Mitchell after Fruitvale Station came out, he was talking about, this was before Marvel was even a thought because he hadn't even made Creed yet, you know? He was talking about like he loves Kurosawa and he loves, you know, like the Criterion Collection. Like those are the movies that influenced and, and inspired him. So I think that's a, a kind and of you can see that Kurosawa sort of, again, sort of broad, like cinematic vision of like oh, yeah. of an imaginary oh, yeah. place yeah. Um, that was yep. really well here's, thought out and really detailed. Here's the thing. Ryan Coogler is 36 years old, born in 1986, and he's from Oakland, California. He went to Cal State um, Sacramento. The the thing, though, is that I can tell that it is a film made by him if people look beautiful, Mm -hmm. strong, fierce, determined, and un... Just, you cannot, you cannot think of them as weak. He makes characters and films where all you see are the best in people, even when they're villains. I mean, no, 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 no more is, is beautiful looking. And at the same time, most of the characters in Ryan's films are also predominantly main characters, dark skinned people. Sure. You know, he could have picked anyone to play Namor. He could have made a, a case where the rest of the Telecon people were light skinned or but they're they're a whole different color. They're blue. Right. Like there's mm-hmm. all these different things that are a wink and a nod to I see you. Do you see yourself in these mm-hmm. films? Yeah. And I, I greatly appreciate that. I don't know. Uh, what it would be like if it was a a, a woman or someone who identifies as females um, writing and directing voice, how things would be different. 
I do think that they would be slightly different. While the women in all of these characters and and the, those particular sort of like femme female characters are all also seen as very strong, they die. They do not pick up uh, the leadership roles at the end of this particular film. It is not Cherie who is there to claim being the Black Panther or the leader of Wakanda. We still see this small child who says, "I'm I'm the prince. I'm my father was the king." Mm. And you see, oh, there's the heir. It's not yeah. Cherie. Yeah. So I still think that there, are, while there are leading women characters in these films, they are not the central characters, and that is kind it's of true. I was interesting. I, was, I didn't even think until you because even when Umbaku that. in his last scene kind of jumps and he's like, "I'm here to challenge for the throne," I'm like, "What's what 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 throne?" I thought we had a Black Panther already. <laughs> right, exactly. right, right. Well, in fairness, like uh, T'Challa had to do that. But sure, he wasn't there for when that. I, see, fight. I thought, I, no, 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 I know I, for a second before I knew what was happening. I thought she was going to step out and she was going to beat him. But I thought because that's kind, to some degree, that's I think what's endearing about Mbaku's character. He's this like, you know, big bear of a guy and he's powerful and strong, but he's also kind of mm-hmm. a doofus to, 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 to some degree. In, at times when it calls for him to be one, when it's time to save someone and help, he, he's 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 always there and he's right on time. But I thought for a split set, literally for a split second, sure, he was going to come out. They're going to have the fight in the water. And somehow she was going to manage to overpower or outsmart him and, and do it just like how mm-hmm. Chadwick did it in, in the first film. But I did also. I, but no, we cut that. away. She's in Haiti. Not Super even there. Clear. I remember being like, oh, wait, huh? What? Yeah, yeah she's not no, in I town. Know. I, know. Yeah. Um, I, I again, I think that. It is interesting. I hadn't really thought about how the female characters are powerful, but maybe don't endure or don't maintain leadership. Um, I think mm-hmm. we still know Shuri's our Black Panther. We haven't had anyone else presented yeah, as a potential yeah. one. I think no. for any it was coming the, franchises, yeah. that's who we have right. for at least a little yeah. bit of time. Yeah. Um, I also like the pageantry that Ryan Coogler brings to it. I feel like every time... People have mm. to walk even every time they're in the throne room. Everyone is just perfectly placed um, and cinematic looking. I don't know. Yeah. His use of color. No, that's a good point. Yeah. I mean, if, if you ever see, especially wh- whether it's an African film that's centered around a wedding or a funeral, whether it's like yeah, the films of like Usman Sembane, where he's he's dealt with both, or Abdurame Sasako, who both he's had films that are centered on both things. There is this kind of parade type pageantry deal. And I and going back to kind of what you said before, like had another filmmaker made that. I don't know if we would have. So I think for, for the world of Marvel, it's it's about as authentic mm-hmm. as you get when it comes to just like the, the I'm not going to say costume, the, the, mm-hmm. the garbs rather or, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. I, I thought that that was pretty authentic. I'm trying to. I'm drawing a blank here. I'm trying to look at what is this? Oh, um, Mother of George, which actually uh, stars. Uh, Denai Guerrero. Denai Guerrero. She, Guerrera. She's the star yeah. of that film. It's actually oh, funny, wow. too. I just realized the co-star of Mother of George is Isaac de Bancole, who's in both Black Panther movies. He just doesn't have any speaking parts. He's the guy with the with the uh, the ring yeah. around his lip. He spoke the, the, a little bit. Lip. And I was like, I can't understand him. Yeah, I can't I understand yeah. Anything he's saying. Yeah, it, it's. The, the movie starts, it's about those two are set to be married. And the whole, fr- like the first 10 minutes of that movie, I mean, there's very much a plot to the movie. It, it's, it's like a Shakespearean Greek tragedy type of comedy. But the first 10 minutes of the movie, it's just an African wedding. And there's like, you know, like trains of people walking and celebrating and dancing. And you get that from um, these Black Panther movies. And, and that's, it's another weird thing too, between the first two Black Panther films a lot of the actors in these movies have appeared together in other films. Like, mm-hmm. for example, like Mother of George, that stars two people from Black Panther and, and, and stuff like that. So, and out, even outside of the Marvel War, so I think maybe there's this chemistry, you know, Chadwick and, um, oh, why am I drawing blanks? Who played uh, Killmonger's father in, in, in the first film. African um, actor. N- um, yeah, yeah, Sterling, yeah. Thank Sterling, you. Yeah, they, they, they were in a film together. Like, there's so many variations of these other people, you know, like, Forrest Whitaker helped produce uh, Fruitvale Station. So there's a, so before this these films kind of even came together, a lot of these actors were familiar with each other. So I think that's also I mean it's also on that, some level the this is Marvel, right? And one could argue this is the best of the best, and he created a whole country. Like sure. how many yeah. how many actors yeah. were available? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it feels like this is a kind um, of movie where a lot of black actors in the mainstream yep. just wanted to be in it even if it was in a small role. I, I I got that so much from the first film, like, you know, Sterling K. Brown, he's only in two scenes, 
Forrest Whitaker. He's kind of in it, you know, Isaac Debancole. Like I said, he's just kind of a background person, but it just feels like, oh, I, I just want to be in this. So, which I completely get, mm-hmm. you know, I understand. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this movie is very much like looks to be focused around women's relationships. I mean, like, do like I, I totally get the point that you made about like the mantle, especially with the future scenes with Toussaint, the heir of T'Challa. But I think it tries to present itself as being a movie about women's relationships with each other. It does. Uh, but the women mm-hmm. always need help from men. You know, like mm-hmm. that's that's the thing. They yeah. need help from the men in order to do anything, including I'm not going to fight you. I need you to not fight. Also, with it's me. true because the the, the yeah. angel devil on Shuri's shoulder, it was like Mbaku on one shoulder saying like, we don't want to be in war forever. And then Killmonger and the other like you want vengeance. That's why I'm here. Um, it was very yeah. her mm-hmm. her her two voices in her ear when she decided to take on the mantle of Black Panther were two men. In the end, it's eventually thinking about her mom and all her mom says is show them the kind of leader you are. And so yeah. you've got the male characters telling you this is what you do. I will I will take the people and hold them here and keep them safe. I think you should do this, that and the other. And all the other female characters are like, you do what you need to do. Show them. <laughs> and it's just it's just very it's just very different. I mean, I think I think for me, the thing is that it. It goes back to the earlier points that Marcus has been making this entire, you know, sort of like episode. And you too, Moji, you know, like we what can we ask for at this point when there still is is so little on the table that we have that is representative and that is representative in a way that is empowering, that is a way that we do want to see ourselves. And so is everything perfect? No, because it's within the construct of an MCU universe. You know, we get to play with the imagination, but it has to be grounded in these stories that already exist in some way, shape or form. I just think, you know, for me, it would have just been interesting. And I hope we get there. I hope we get to a point where these kinds of films that show folks of color in in powerful, you know, positions and and storylines and narratives that they are also then made by women of color to also show us yeah. how that could potentially yeah. be different. I think for all my harping about wanting to go to, to Wakanda, that is a one of the problems I do have with the love that we all have for Black Panther in is that like this is a imaginary place. Like I don't know, it feels uh, when people are like, oh let's do this Wakanda thing. I'm just like we're we're just play acting. Like we don't we have real stuff? I was always I, and sometimes I give people too much credit when yeah in 2018 i always thought that that would be like a catalyst to explore the concept the actual continent and the actual countries inside but instead there's like it's almost like sometimes you know what kind of right. real place right <laughs> folks you know when, when when it deals with kids it's different because i get it but even that it's kind of like hey use this as a way to here's a map of africa here's all the countries now let's kind of explore because these countries from this continent are a huge part of the recipe of what Right. Wakanda and Black Panther is so maybe check out the real stuff and I'm sure that's been done but I think on, for the most part on, on a larger scale it's just like hey we love this made up imaginary place uh so I guess to some degree I guess when it comes to adults I think it's a little it's a reductive. little reductive and to some degree yeah, 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 young yeah, young people also because I don't want them to get stuck on this fake place when there's real yeah. places you know it's a little like reductive that, so. and sometimes as a as a non-cosplaying person it almost feels a, a little it just it almost feels a little lame sometimes, even though again I get I, I, I get agree. excited. I agree. I, I was um, trying to no, be nice. I, I like I, I like nice both. My feet are in work. both, both the right pools word. at the same time. Um, and I'm 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 a new parent. I have I have a, I have a young son, and he's and these are things I have to be conscious of, like things that are geared towards kids and family and stuff like that. So, and my dad was like that too. Like my you know he's I, I guess well it, he's he wasn't alive by the time my pen, the first one came out, but my dad would have been the kind of person where he would have loved it. But he immediately would have taken me to the library and gotten me books on like real a- Africa. Like he was just that kind of dad. So, you know, yeah. That's so kind I'm, of I'm what's interesting. That, you know? That's kind of what's interesting about this particular time and place, you know, like right, right before Wakanda Forever comes out, you have the woman king. And so yeah. you have you have these these things that are coming out to sort of show the elements that are true. And for, you know, Namor and Mesoamerica, you know, the actor Tenoch, he is Mayan. You know, mm-hmm. Mayan people right. exist. still just exist. exist. Chichen Itza, you could still go see Chichen Itza. The feathered yeah. serpent is there, right? Like, so there's a way in which 
What's interesting is that like, is this, is this actually really the future? Because if climate right. change goes in the way that everybody is anticipating it will, I'm sorry, but Chichen Itza at the, you know, at the, at the peninsula of Mexico is going to be underwater. Oh. Is Talacan and all of that actually the future, not actually another world? I, I'm really glad that you brought that conflation up, specifically the woman king, because I I don't remember who, but I was talking to a friend of mine and I was like, you know, they were like, oh, should I see Black Panther? I was like, so did you see, you know, are you up one of the other films? And they were like, well, I haven't seen the woman king. And I'm like, it's not related. Like, it's not. That's not the no, same really, thing. Really, it's I, like I, real, real fake. I it's think like, from, yeah, I think from a movie studio standpoint, Whoever produced that movie was like, "Oh Everyone yeah, we're going to get on yeah. this Wakanda train." But I think the filmmakers didn't have that in mind. This was it was wild that yeah. an adult person that, said know, the, to me know, the, that was the missing film in the MCU, and I was like, "No, you yeah. haven't. That's not. Those are different yeah. things." And you should also I mean, see listen, the woman game. The, <laughs> the the art house nerd in me wants people to explore like actual African film, but I, unfortunately, I don't think most folks would do that. But maybe that I guess that's what my film blog is for, among other things. So. You want to get a pillow at empire.com. I write about that stuff. Yes. So, so, so much more. But again, it, it, yeah, it, this goes back to me giving people t- too much credit. I think the world is people who are mostly focused in the world of Marvel aren't going to want to, you know, delve into um, African uh, c- 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 cinema. Or well, I think my, my listeners, I was going to say, or maybe. Yeah. I that? feel like, oh, yeah, I feel like I'm oh, both. No, 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 maybe, maybe. I, I, I'm just, again, I'm, I'm very skeptical when it comes to giving folks credit but that is true you you you, you never know because there's a lot of you know it, it it's unfortunate when you explore that entire continent as much as i do it's crazy to just take an entire continent and call it, oh african cinema there's so much like there's action films there's art house there's you know there's all kinds of stuff to you know to to explore north african cinema is nothing like you know southern african cinema because again it, it's a whole continent so there, there's there's so much to explore i think well, a lot um, of that i think a lot of the african films that reach the, I'm using air quotes, mainstream are usually focused in some kind of like struggle and uh, oppression. And and I know that there are regions of Africa that face that, but there's like, there's a lot of lighthearted stories uh, in African cinema. There's a lot of comedy, there's romance, there's all kinds of stuff. So I just wish more folks would kind of explore that because it's all there. And in 2022 yeah. with digital files and streaming, it, it, it's, you can't, it's not like 20 years ago where it's like, well, it didn't play in my theater. It's like, it doesn't matter now. There's so many streaming platforms to see these things on that, you know. Well, if you had one, rec- one just a couple movie recommendations like that you would have for folks, like thinking about my listeners, what about like actiony stuff that like might be connected? Oh man. The int- oh my yeah. gosh. So, <laughs> um, uh, Abba Makama, he did this film a couple of years ago called The Lost Okoroshi. It's a um, Nigerian Nollywood superhero film. It's funny. It's got action in it. It's got like the costume design is amazing. I, I, I saw it at Toronto uh, in um, 2019 and I've just become buddies with, with the director. He was on our podcast uh, and it's just a really great film. Um, and if you like Black Panther, you know, like I mentioned, See Mother of George, it features two cast members from Black Panther as husband and wife, like I said, in this kind of like Shakespearean comedy, Greek tragedy, like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened type type, type of a movie. It, 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 it's really good. And tell and, our listeners you know, where they can keep up with your work online. Oh, just uh, www.pinlandempire.com. Uh, that's where, that's kind of the hub of everything. So you can get to all of my other podcast appearances, all of my outside uh, film writing for all different kinds of platforms. Uh, the Pink Smoke, that, that's kind of my home away from home. That, you know, it's another film site. I've actually been writing on there even longer than Pinland Empire. Um, so the pinksmoke.com, pinlandempire.com. Uh, for the time being, uh, you can follow me on at p- uh, pinland underscore empire on Twitter for however long it's going to be around. And then 20 or 40 minutes. Exactly. And yeah. then my I have my alt account on Twitter, which is at Hakuto Empire, which is just geared towards like action films from all over. I wanted to talk about the significance of Haiti. I wanted to talk about being a mutant. I want to talk about lessons for movement building, but like we gotta, I, I know we can't, we can't go endlessly. Well, I'm down um, for a part two if, folks, if you wanted to. I would you know, yeah. love to <laughs> see it again and do a part two. I feel like there's so much there, yeah. such rich, richness in the film. Yeah. Is there anything folks want to make sure we hit up before we, before I have Felicia and Moji do their sign offs? I just think what you just said is is super, super important. You know, like I can't think of the last time I saw a movie that featured the naming of the country, 
people in the country and talking about it. It wasn't just like, you know, Haiti came up once. Haiti was referred to multiple times and was returned to at the end, right? Like Haiti is now yeah. on on the map cin- cinematically as like a location and a place of something transformative and amazing prince. happening as it at, yes right like this is this is amazing and and the film itself was was filmed either at MIT in Atlanta and mostly in Puerto Rico you know like and so also like where these these films are actually being you know filmed at is also important in terms of not only the 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 calling in and bringing center you know to these countries that are often not seen in this particular way when we do see them on the screen or mentioned and then also like where the money is going to in terms of the locations right like things being in Atlanta yeah. things being in Puerto Rico from start to finish these are important decisions and choices and they make a difference on and off screen I mean, I think that them going to Haiti might have been a response to, I saw a number of people responding to the original Black Panther movie saying that they wish that more places in the Black diaspora, like in the Caribbean, had been included in the Wakanda. Um, and I like, I literally, I, I wish I could remember who wrote about it, but I've literally seen like Haitian and Dominican Black um, critics mentioning that. And so I almost feel like seeing Haiti brought in in this movie was like, recognizing that like yes that's it's a good also idea we should do such that. a significant <laughs> choice because haiti was the first um african nation to free itself like the first you know what i mean the first of the new world to free yeah. itself from slavery yeah. and so haiti has that distinction um in the african diaspora of being a place of freedom for black people who have been enslaved so i think that specifically that choice is also i think really important uh, so mochi tell me where are where can our listeners keep oh. up with your work uh, pending the Twitter. Um, I barely Twitter, but Abortion Access Front, the organization I work with, um, we are at Abortion Front on all the places. And I am personally at Moji Locks, M-O-J-I-L-O-C-K-S, um, on all of the socials. Um, there's not a whole lot to see there. Um, and if you want to hear me yammer a lot um, on my podcast, This Feminist Buzz Kills Live, me, uh, Liz Winstead, and my co-host Marie Khan talk about all things abortion uh most fridays um usually the the week in abortion the month in abortion uh what's happening and what can be done and we're all fun so listen up that's fabulous and felicia where can our folks keep up with your work well uh you can follow me at on most social platforms at socal luchador um and that is um on instagram i have left twitter um, it just didn't feel like the right place. Um, and uh, that's probably the best uh, place to follow and get insights. But also FeliciaPerez.com uh, will also have some other resources and things as well. As for me, um, I am still reckoning with like, I will certainly be on. I'm really going to be like, the last person to turn the lights off on Twitter, probably. But I am still there. E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. And that is my handle on Mastodon. Whatever platforms people end up on, that'll be my handle. Even if I wanted to switch it, I feel like I can't switch it because I need people to be able to find me. Um, so I want to thank our guests for joining me. Um, I know that we have some R additional uh, comics, movies, film, and culture coverage coming up for you all soon. And um, Graphic Policy Radio is the place for that. And just one last shout out again to uh, the creator of The Submariner, Bill Everett, because remember, all these comics characters only exist because an artist invented them, not because some corporate entity like generated them. These are these are works from artists, and I, I wish there were more clear ways to support. You know, he 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 he's no longer with us, right? But like to support the artists to continue to make work for that these movies are based on, continuing to make work today. Um, so uh, graphicpolicy.com and keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.